Yeah, uh, this is the three o'clock block, the three o'clock block here on ThinkTech uh, on a given uh, Wednesday. And I'm here with Kevin Tan. He's in Singapore uh, and he joins us by Zoom to talk about uh, comparative constitutional law with, with a, a lot of an overlay of international law because those are his specialties. Uh, welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much, Jay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good to talk with you because um, you know, your subjects are really dear to my heart. And um, I, I looked at your CV and I, and I think you can help me understand a lot of things. So let me, let me ask you about constitutional law in Asia, uh, in Singapore and in other Asian countries. Where did these constitutions come from? Are they modeled in any way after the US constitution? Um, and if, if not, where did they come from and how are they different or similar? Well, first of all, let, let, let me try and uh, situate Asia. Uh, when, when I talk about Asia, at least for the purposes of our, our conversation here, I'm referring uh, pretty much to about 26 countries that occupy Northeast Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, right? So I don't include sort of uh, Afghanistan, nor do I include sort of uh, Iran and, and, and those countries, or Central, Central Asia. So largely, uh, these territories. Now, in fact, if you look at the history of all of these territories, uh, other than uh, China, Japan, uh, Thailand, Nepal, every other country in Asia was once a colony of another country. Most of them were colonies of European countries. Uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> colonization that took place largely between the 17th and the 19th centuries. Uh, so you had first the Portuguese come to the region, uh, and then you had the Dutch, then you had the English, and then you had the French. Uh, and so uh, other than these four countries that I've named, everyone else was previously a colony. And of course, uh, Japan itself was a colonizer and, and occupied uh, Korea, uh, uh, Taiwan, all right? Uh, and then of course, during the Second World War, uh, large swathes of the rest of uh, island Southeast Asia and mainland Southeast Asia. So uh, if you come from that background, then I think you would appreciate the fact that um, for several hundred years, the idea of constitutionalism was not something that would be uh, homegrown uh, because you were largely a colony. Uh, and uh, ideas about control of government state uh, rights and so on flowed from the West in that sense. And as far as the US Constitution is concerned, uh, it obviously served as an important model as it did as it does for many, many other countries. I mean, the US Constitution has been around for over 200 years. Uh, you know, it has it is one which has been studied uh, uh, alongside some others, right? Such as the old Weimar Constitution. Uh, such as some of the old Scandinavian constitutions and so on. So when uh, the decolonization process took place uh, between the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, these were models which were looked at for sure. All right. Uh, and so obviously ideas uh, that were embedded in these constitutions also began to take root in slightly different forms uh, in different parts of Asia. Well, um, you know, and you're, teach, you're teaching constitutional law right at, at the NUS, National University of Singapore. You've been doing that for 20 years or so, I think. Um, years, but yes. <laughs> but, but who's counting? Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and, and what's, what's interesting about it is that, um, you know, they, they may be similar. They may derive off similar roots. And they may have this common denominator notion of self government, self-government. A constitution bespeaks of the people govern the place through the lens, through the powers of the constitution. This is a tremendous idea. Um, on the other hand, it strikes me these days that it's, it's not a permanent, necessarily, it's not a permanent idea. And constitutions can go south. I do, I do not mean that geographically. Um, okay. Constitutions can erode. So my, my question to you is, in Asia, um, in the countries that have constitutions, however they got them, uh, is constitutional management, constitutional governance, self-governance healthy? 
Um, or is, is, it, is it on the rise? Is it on the fall? Um, how is it doing, Kevin? Wow. Okay, that's a big question, a difficult one, given that uh, we are talking about something like 26 different territories. But let me try and uh, uh, summarize my, my thoughts on this. First of all, as I was trying to uh, suggest, uh, coming out of the idea of decolonization, uh, one of the main priorities for many of the new uh, governments of these independent states was to centralize power, not to dissipate it. So this is one of the uh, major challenges to constitutionalism, because the idea of constitutional law, I mean, if, if nothing else, is to dissipate power. It is to separate powers so that uh, no one body or, or, or entity or individual can command uh, all that power, which could lead to tyranny, of course, right? So this is one of the first biggest challenges for constitutionalism in Asia. That is the tendency for all states to first be states. So one can talk about nation building, but actually what Asia has been doing for the last 60 years, uh, 70 years, has actually been state building. You still have to, you have to build the state uh, first uh, in order to, to govern. In other words, uh, if it's about law and order, it's order first. You, you've got to get order before you can have law because without, with, without order, there, there can't be law. So this is one of the biggest challenges, right? So there's a centralizing tendency which goes against the grain of the idea of the separation of powers and the division and checks and balances. That, that's the first major challenge. The second major challenge uh, for constitutionalism in Asia is the need to deal in most cases with um, very pluralistic societies. Uh, many boundaries were drawn in artificial fashion during uh, the colonial era within Asia. Uh, lines were drawn not across natural boundaries like, like uh, ge geographical features, or nor were they separated by sort of distinct uh, eth ethnic groups and so on, but you had uh, an agglomeration of different, different peoples having different traditions, languages, religions in many, many parts of Asia. Of course, there are some parts that are more homogeneous, right? So if you look at, say, Japan, uh, Korea, slightly more homogeneous, but the moment you come to Southeast Asia, or even South Asia, uh, you begin to see uh, plurality. So the management of plurality within these entities is a major challenge, right? How do you ensure that uh, none of the minority groups gets oppressed? How do you ensure that one religion uh, doesn't end up, you know, suppressing or being privileged over all the others, right? So this is uh, the second major challenge to constitutionalism in Asia. Mm. And, and so uh, if, if one wants to look at it, and for many years, I would say, um, Western um, scholars of constitutional law never bothered looking at Asia because they thought, oh, well, you know, <clears throat> in most cases, it's pretty much a basket case because, you know, they don't really have an independent judiciary or that uh, there isn't that separation of powers and so on. Um, but uh, that is to ignore the social milieu in which constitutions are, are, are trying to operate within the region. Uh, what is the health of um, constitutionalism in the region? Well, it, it would be a very varied report card. You see um, constitutionalism being um, uh, faithfully uh, practiced, I think, or at least increasingly faithfully practiced in some states in Asia. Uh, one could uh, uh, name a few, uh, like uh, uh, Japan and in Korea, in Taiwan, uh, even in the case of Singapore, although I think most Americans would think otherwise, but uh, you, you, know, you can see that uh, increasingly people are taking constitutions seriously. Uh, but again, like you said, there is no uh, guarantee of a progression, right? There's sometimes a regression and uh, that we have seen. So for example, if you take uh, uh, the Philippines, it was doing very well after uh, they got rid of Marcos and the People Revolution of 1986 and so on. But you see a backsliding, right? 
uh, and this is happening around the world. I think we see that even in the United States, um, you know, the United States, uh, in the founding of the United States, the how the 55 you know, founding fathers came together in Philadelphia in 1787 is such a remarkable story uh, that can never be repeated. You, you would not find in the same room uh, people of that caliber with those very ideals uh, that embodied the nation and, and how they fought for them. Uh, and they understood right, how uh, these things work. And in fact, uh, in the first years of the American Republic, there were problems. I mean, uh, it wasn't smooth sailing. It, it wasn't as if you put out a constitution and then, you know, hey, presto, uh, you're going to have a, a good constitutional government. No, I mean, there were, there were big problems. Uh, Jefferson wanted to get rid of the constitution. He thought it should be revised every 12 or 13 years, um, you know, and there were, you, you know, controls against the press and so on. So, you, you know, in every uh, society, uh, constitutional law, the ideals of constitutionalism uh, can work. It's much harder to get it to work. It's much easier for it to regress. And uh, 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 my view after studying you know, all these many constitutions is that ideas, uh, constitutionalism embodies a set of ideals uh, which allow us within a society to manage expectations of people across the spectrum, the political spectrum. One problem is that it cannot deal with extreme ends of the poll, right? In other words, uh, uh, in other words, if you have a very clearly divided society between you know uh, uh, people at extreme ends with nothing in the center, uh, then constitutionalism is not going to work. You're going to have uh, internecine fighting. You're going to have secessionist movements, and 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 because the twain can never meet. Constitutionalism is about giving a platform to allow these uh, uh, differences to be compromised and to be consolidated and for people to make bargains that can hold everyone together. In other words, it acts as a mediating influence, uh, which you know, brings everyone together. Once that is pulled apart, once the center cannot hold, Right, you hollow out the center, uh, then you're going to have extreme ends of the poles fighting, uh, and they will the, the twain will never meet, and that's when your your constitution is going to collapse. Okay, I have gee, I have several questions pop out of that. Um, it strikes me that um, you have to have the you have to have the the basic agreement, um, you know, the, the social compact, if you will, that that we are going to have this sovereignty, we are going to have this um, this state. And the order, and we we have to agree on that first. Then we have to agree on the rules. Um, but there are some factors in the rules that we should talk about. You know, one is the rules should treat um, should allow compromise, should require compromise, and 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 take care to uh, encourage people to to stay closer to the center and not and not, you know, become polar. Um, the other thing is we we have we have to avoid um, corruption. Uh, and we have to avoid gaming, gaming the, the Constitution. Because mm -hmm. if we game the Constitution, you know, that's a tremendous undermine. And in the United States now, of course, the big question, and this may exist elsewhere as well, is, is um, how do you allow for an orderly, peaceful trans transition of power? Um, you know, we all grew up thinking, I'm sure you, you thought about this uh, when you were at Yale and and for that matter, all through your studies, uh, you know, around the world, and all the writing you've done, that it, it was a given that we could have, for the most part, orderly transition, transfer of power. Now we find that it's not a guarantee, that, that you can gain the system, um, you can gain the transfer of power, and in the process, you can turn the Constitution and the constitutional democracy into something else. And this, I don't think the founding fathers were thinking about this. I think they realized there were issues. They realized that you'd have a need for change, sort of to remake the social compact somehow, to re, to 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 re to rethink it, to reimagine it, to recommit to it. But that's not a guarantee. And now, if finding that constitutional democracies 
you know, the United States is a leader, I suppose, because it has, you know, it was the first major constitutional democracy in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're finding that maybe, maybe it, it wasn't perfect, or uh, as you say, it was flawed, but the imperfections now are becoming worse. And I wonder if the problems in Washington and the United States in general are making people in other constitutional, arguably un constitutional democracies, a little less secure, a little less confident that what they have believed all these years about the transfer of power and, you know, and as you said, a, a fair-minded platform um, to negotiate differences, whether those things are as um, as guarantees they used to be. Well, I, I, uh, I think one of the dangers is to think that just because you have something of a semi-permanent uh, document like the Constitution that it is. It acts as some kind of a guarantee. There is no such thing, right? In 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 society, uh, we need to constantly re-engage and remobilize the community uh, to arrive at shared uh, traditions, shared principles, and ideas about how that state should be run. Um, and uh, this is a major challenge today because uh, now okay, just speaking about the US Constitution, one of the biggest problems in the United States, uh, and some people consider this to be a major virtue, but I consider it to be a major problem, uh, is the uh, very onerous uh, amendment process uh, for constitutional amendments. Right? In other words, if you wanted to have an amendment to the US Constitution, I mean, US Constitution has been around for over 200 years, you have what twenty six amendments. Uh, you 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 don't uh, you can't amend the constitution easily. Now some people would say, well, that's great because you know all these you know important ideals and values have somehow become ossified in the constitution. Well, that's the problem with ossification because it's not dynamic. You are not actually responding uh, to the needs of society at any one point, which is why you know, the battles for appointments to the Supreme Court and battles within the US Supreme Court are so, fer so ferocious because if I can't amend the constitution by changing the words, then maybe I can amend the constitution by getting the right people to say the right things about the constitution, right? In the way of constitutional interpretation. So I think that is one of the big problems. Constitutions should be somewhat permanent. They should be e harder to amend than ordinary legislation. So you do not end up, for example, being captive to a particularly popular uh, political party that comes in at one time with a landslide victory, and then they just sort of overhaul everything and throw everything out. I mean, that's, that's not the idea. It should be more difficult, but it should not be next to impossible to amend, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, and, 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 and let me just wrap up on this. And in the amendment process, right, some amendments are technical, so we won't bother with those. But there are those which involve what I call constitutional politics, where, you know, values, political values, key political values need to be uh, uh, put forward, validated, and so on. And that's when some kind of mass mobilization, the involvement of the mythical the people. I mean, in the United States, your voting system doesn't really engage the uh, 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 the people at large. You have electoral college, for example, and even in the case of, of voting, uh, it's not compulsory. You know, some people would say, well, that's a violation of my, my freedom of choice. I can choose not to vote. But if you work things out mathematically, uh, those who don't vote simply emphasize uh, the results of those who do, one way or the other, right? Uh, and, and so it looks, you know, we can say, well, so and so has got you know fifty six percent, but actually fifty six percent of what, right? And 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 that silent majority then it, 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 you know doesn't speak. So so these are the kinds of problems you need to be able to respond to changing needs of society. You need to engage the public through some form of mobilization, uh, and an important discussion of of the rules. 
Now, the problem is if you can't change the rules, then you game it. You just game the system, right? Uh, and of course, there is the other problem of politicians today uh, who don't believe that the rules matter anymore uh, for whatever reason. And um, there are not enough people who, who will stand up and say, no, excuse me, you can't do that. Uh, that's not what we are about. You don't have enough people who can stand up there because you've got this document you can't change. And so, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the, the counter argument would be, well, I'm not going to be, going to be governed by the dead hand of somebody, uh, you know, uh, who drafted this over 200 years ago. So that's the big challenge. Well, right now in the U.S., I, I don't know if this is worldwide or Asia-wide, but right now in the U.S., the, the Constitution is really not working. Uh, our Congress is a, is a casualty. Uh, many people think the Supreme Court is a casualty. Um, and um, so, you know, what we have is, is a government that can't handle the issues that need to be handled. In the 21st century, there are many things, there are many complexities that must be handled, and our, our government in the United States can't handle it. And so what we need is a change. I suppose we could mobilize, and, and clearly people are mobilizing around voting rights and the like, but there are so many other issues, structural issues. And I think what's coming out of it is the general sense on both sides of the equation, right and left, um, you know, that the Constitution isn't, isn't working. And they either game it or ignore it, and, and maybe, maybe they move to Singapore, uh, where, where life, life is better. <laughs> but, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, we have our own challenges as well, right? I mean, uh, uh, of course, we are a very tiny little city state, five and a half million people. Uh, we, are, we are the size of, you know, of, of a mid-sized American city. Uh, really, we're not, we're, we're not that difficult to govern uh, in that sense. But of course, we have our fair share of problems as well. And for many years, like in many developing countries, we did struggle with this, uh, 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 the notion of constitutionalism. Uh, we have had one political party that's in power since 1959 and has never been defeated at the polls. Uh, and uh, and I, I would like to say here, there is, there is no voter fraud in Singapore. Uh, uh, you There's know. no voter fraud here either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's, here's uh, what concerns me. Uh, so, so you have the, the you know, two sides that People are losing confidence in, in the government and in the Constitution. Um, people are trying to game the system or ignore the system or override the system somehow. The, the social fabric seems to have deteriorated. Uh, we don't know exactly when that started, but certainly it's, it's been exacerbated recently. So the question is, where does a country go that used to have a Constitution, I mean, a working Constitution, that used to have the public confidence in the Constitution, but has found that there are flaws and it doesn't have a, a way to solve the flaws or, or come together on it. Where does it go? Does it go the way of the, the Weimar Republic? Uh, where does it wow. go? And do you have any experiences in Asia that would be informative on this? Well, that's the, well, you, you know, interesting that you mentioned the Weimar Republic because, you know, that was completely destroyed. It facilitated the rise of uh, National Socialism and the rise of Hitler. And so uh, is that going to happen? Well, uh, much as we don't want that to happen, that is a distinct possibility simply because the public gets so fed up with things not moving, with things not happening, with uh, you know, the inability of the state, which is paralyzed in dealing with many of these problems. Uh, and, 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 and although Americans have a very high, I would say, constitutional consciousness, nobody walks around thinking about the constitution all day, right? Uh, it only pops up when you realize, oh goodness, you mean that's a constitutional problem, right? But um, when you have a public that is, uh, you, you know, totally disillusioned with your constitutional order, then you are setting up the stage for someone, something to come along and to show uh, that things can work in a better way. And of course, that gives rise to the possibility, the specter 
of a uh, of, of of a demagogue coming in uh, and and then taking over and then throwing the old constitution out and 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 maybe rebuilding it. Uh, I'm afraid I'm just a constitutional law professor. I'm not a politician. And I'm, <laughs> I I can't solve the the the, the these kinds of problems uh, in Asia. Um, the problem is not so uh, endemic uh, for, a sep for, for several reasons. One, constitutions are not that difficult to amend. So you can amend constitutions. Of course, you don't want constitutions to be changing all the time. I mean, uh, Thailand is, is, is on its 20th constitution since 1932. And I'm not talking about amendments. I'm talking about new constitutions, right? You, you don't want... You don't want you know, constitutions to be changing like diapers all the time. You you do want it to have some permanence. You want it to really matter uh, to everybody. Uh, the only way that it can matter to everybody is that the values embedded in the constitutional order uh, is something that is transmitted down the generations. Uh, the belief that that there is some responsibility. It is it is not just an irritating hurdle to be surmounted. It has to be something that, you know, when politicians and judges say that they swear to defend the constitution, what do they mean by that? Uh, it cannot be that, well, you know, yes, I will abide by the constitution. No, that is quite different from saying that I will defend the constitution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And what are you defending? You're defending the values, the traditions, that are embedded in the document, not the bare words of, of the document. So, you know, um, when I went to law school, constitutional law was kind of a burden. Uh, it was hard. Uh, the teachers okay. who taught it were always brilliant. I remember a fellow named Norman Dorson. He was my constitutional ah. professor. And he was a, an amazing man. Uh, he a Great comparativist, he, yes. Yes, and uh, gee, I, I remember him well. And I thought, well, if I can only get through this course, this is a hard course. It's largely theoretical and philosophical. Uh, it doesn't have any immediate uh, relevance to the ordinary day-to-day -day practice of law. Uh, if you wanted to go down to Wall Street, you could make some money, but not at constitutional law. That, that is yes. an academic subject for the yes. most part. Unless maybe you, you know, you're one of those guys like Larry Tribe uh, goes to the Supreme Court and wins all these cases and they pay him well for that. But you know, here you are, and it's, it's more than just teaching it. Um, you know, uh, uh, law, lawyers are the backbone of, the, of a country. Um, law professors are the backbone of the lawyers, at least theoretically. Um, and constitutional lawyers which, and professors, uh, which have really been in the background for years and years, at least in this country, maybe in a Asia as well, you know, except in a crisis perhaps, um, they, they, they're not running Wall Street. They're not necessarily running the country politically, as you said. And the question is, um, why do you do this? Why are you committed to do this? And do you, and this is my big question, Kevin, <clears throat> do you agree with me that in these difficult times, not only here, but everywhere, a constitutional lawyer is busier, more valuable, more in demand, more relevant, more influential than ever before, at least in our lifetimes? Well, I'm not quite sure about the, let me take the last bit first, uh, you know, whether or not it is the, you know, we continue to be uh, as influential. I mean, I think we are as influential as, as we, uh, as our societies will allow us to be. Um, why do we do this? Well, I think because we believe that principles are important. Uh, there, are, <laughs> there are many people who do believe that, you know, making a big pile of money on Wall Street isn't the be all and end all of life. It, it's, it's attractive, but not that attractive. And the other things are a little bit more attractive. What you do find constitutional lawyers doing um, is, is in the education, I mean, really trying to educate and trying also to be some kind of public intellectual where you actually share your views about certain things, uh, where uh, you, 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 you form opinions uh, that, you know, hopefully coming from, a, well, it's very hard to be totally uh, objective in these things, but, you know, coming from a more objective scholarly point of view where you can actually point out 
where the flaws of certain arguments might be, uh, you actually do shed light on what uh, is the right thing and what's the wrong thing. Um, and so, uh, yes, you're right. In times of crisis like this, we are much busier. I, I am currently, uh, although I'm here in Singapore, but uh, Malaysia is just you know, a few kilometers away. And right now there is a huge constitutional crisis looming in Malaysia. You had this amazing uh, 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 images uh, videos of uh, you know uh, politicians, everyone wielding the federal constitution, arguing that the prime minister had broken the law and that he should have placed the declaration of emergency before the house. And so this is an ongoing crisis. And uh, I am you know endlessly on WhatsApp with my Malaysian colleagues, who are all of course writing in various uh, op-ed pieces in different publications and websites trying to explain to the public, look, you know, let's not be hysterical. This is actually what's going on, right? That's a small role. It's a very, very small role. Uh, I, I think we can play, but uh, one which I think we, we, we enjoy and should play it. <laughs> well, you know, it, it uh, strikes me that education of the public, and uh, you, 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 you termed it awareness uh, of, of the public, of the basic compact, the social compact, legal compact of a constitutional country is so important. And uh, regrettably, uh, one of the problems in the US is that people have not been trained in that. The average uh, graduate of a high school has no idea about these things, and he is completely unprepared to deal with uh, this, the obligations of a citizen. And as you said, he's not obligated to vote anyway. And so the whole thing is skewed from where the founding fathers might want it uh, to be. And so the, the educational feature here, I think, is very important. Now, you may educate uh, lawyers and, and maybe officials more than you do, you know, the average high school graduate, but somehow it should filter down. It should filter around from where you are and the kinds of, uh, you know, moral questions that you treat uh, into the general public. Is it? Are they? Are they aware? Are they in tune with these issues? Well, I think, uh, you, you, you know, at least just speaking for myself, I see, I see my role a little bit differently from other people. And maybe because I've been doing, doing this for a long time and I'm not a junior scholar having to deal with, you know, promotions, tenures and so on, uh, that uh, the public education element is extremely important. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned talking about teaching constitutionalism to high school, uh, high school uh, students. And I've, I've actually written a book a small little primer, just 200 odd pages, targeted at, uh, at, at, at the high school level. And um, it hasn't sold that many copies, but uh, it's available in all the school libraries. And so I've actually had students come to law school and said, hey, I read your book when I was in high school, which is nice, right? Uh, I'm currently trying to see if I can find a good, um, comic manga artists who can work with me to make it even more accessible uh, uh, as a way of educating people about these constitutional principles. I, I've, I've actually been, been uh, collecting a whole stack of uh, very interesting, you know, sort of uh, uh, comics, mangas, and so on, uh, <laughs> with the view to see how that can be used as an educational tool. Uh, you, you want to remove resistance. Young people like things like that. And so if I can get it, goodness, animated, that would be fantastic. See, even law professors change with the times. <laughs> we, need to, we need to, otherwise we will lose our audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk about uh, one other thing, last thing. As you know, uh, we have had shows with a number of the law professors at Hong Kong University over the last few years. And we have heard their frustration with, um, you know, the end of the rule of law in Hong Kong, and it seems like it has ended. Um, and they're involved in a dynamic, and I think they started out being ordinary law professors, but as, as um, you know, Beijing put more pressure on Hong Kong, uh, they, they moved to the left, um, and, uh, and to the point where a lot of them have had to leave Hong Kong and, yes. not, and never, ever go back to either Hong Kong or mainland China. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not to say that you're in the same situation, certainly you aren't, but I wonder about your dynamic over all these years 
uh, being a constitutional oppressor and, and following the way it moves, the way the animal changes, uh, because it does change, uh, where have you moved? Have you moved to the right? Have you moved to the left? You know, you listed a bunch of the topics uh, that you're most interested in, and they seem to include a, uh, a healthy dose of human rights and the like. And I wonder if you, that's your dynamic, Kevin. Can you talk about that? Well, I, 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 this is a really interesting question. In fact, uh, this was something which one of my junior colleagues uh, said to me a couple of years ago. Um, you, you know, when, when I first started out in, in, in working on constitutional law, human rights, and so on, um, well, I saw myself, and I think most people saw myself as kind of left of center, you know, not far left, but, you know, that would be, in Singapore context, that would have been, you know, being a Marxist or something, but no, no, I was, you know, sort of left of center. And my, and my young colleagues uh, came up to me and said, well, you know, um, you're, you're too much on the right these days. And I couldn't help but wonder what happened. So I started thinking about, you know, looking back at what I've been writing and so on. And actually, I don't think I have moved. In other words, my position has, has pretty much been consistent uh, all these years. But what has happened is that the ground has shifted. And when the ground has shifted, someone who used to be on the left now turns up to be on the right. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> consistency is so important. <laughs> yeah, consistency, except that, you know, like I said, the ground shifts. So, you know, where you are, you know, ends up being moved as well, right? Relatively speaking. Well, what's your advice to uh, somebody who is teaching, practicing, learning about constitutional law in the United States at, at this critical point in time when the whole thing seems to be in a kind of apocalypse? Uh, what's your advice about mm, preserving, wow. preserving the Constitution? I, 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 I wouldn't dare uh, think to advise any of my American colleagues about what they should be doing. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you could continue the same merry old route talking about, you know, the, uh, the ideas and so on. But I, my, my view is that um, maybe it's time for another convention, whether at Philadelphia or otherwise, it's time for another convention to relook the American Constitution. It's done incredible service for over 200 years. Uh, it, it's looking a bit long in the teeth. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it, it's time, maybe a new generation of thinkers, of idealists can come together and maybe you know, recharge the Constitution, uh, forge a new compact that can take America forward for another 200 years. And if that could happen, it would be, wouldn't it, a global event? It would be it, a, a thousand feet high. Everyone would want to know about it and, and we, follow it. A constitutional lawyer around the world will be watching with bated breath. Yeah. Kevin Tan, thank you so much for joining us. It's really a, a great to be with you, to be in your office there and see all those books and, and hear the sound of constitutional thinking over a lifetime of career. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. Aloha.